Market Freights. And Mr. Inge joins me right now. And we're going to discuss this story in great detail, drivers. And, uh, sir, welcome back. I'm glad you can join us for, for a few minutes this afternoon. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. I appreciate you joining us here. Now, you've had the chance to look over some of the research with this. Mr. Boltman is contending that federal legislation would provide everybody with clear guidance for what constitutes a safe motor carrier. Is he right in your estimation? What have you found? Well, you know, I think certainly the goal is admirable, and I think that uh, something does definitely need to be done. Um, And in terms of providing guidance at the federal level for what constitutes a safe motor carrier is an excellent, excellent idea. I haven't had a chance to read through the proposed legislation itself yet, uh, but certainly the goal uh, that he's trying to accomplish is admirable and will be very, very beneficial for brokers uh, and shippers across the country. Okay, and with the presence of an overarching federal standard, would that also, in your estimation, dilute the plaintiff's bar strategy of maybe suing brokers in state court over their roles in selecting some of the carriers out there involved in accidents while hauling the product? Well, I'll tell you, on the plaintiff side, I've seen some success. I know there was a case up in uh, Chicago, or actually, I take it back in Illinois, um, a few uh, months ago that came about where a broker was sued. And I, I think that the effect of federal legislation would be very useful. I think it would tend to negate some of that. But I've, I've been surprised to see some of these courts begin to rule that you know the shipper and the broker does have some liability here um, simply because – it goes against the contractual nature of what a shipping contract is, mm-hmm. uh, particularly if you're using an owner-operator or uh, you know an independent contractor in that regard. Um, and I think that to, to some extent that is a result of um, judges and perhaps juries to some extent simply not understanding the trucking mm-hmm. business uh, and, and the trucking market and what it, what it actually entails. Oh, and trial attorneys, uh, be my guide on this, have succeeded in recent years in winning some pretty big state court judgments against the brokers by persuading juries that the carrier or the driver was either in the broker's employment at the time of the accident or that the broker was negligent in vetting the carrier's safety record. Uh, a lot of complex twists and turns with that. There, there has been you know, a recent trend where people have argued that. I've seen two successful cases so far. I'm sure there's more of them out there that I'm just not aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my mind, it is... Um, just simply unexcusable for a judge or jury to determine that based on a bill of lading that the broker somehow exercised the necessary amount of control mm-hmm. over the truck driver, him or herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and what those plaintiff's attorneys have argued uh, is simply that um, the terms of the bill of lading, which generally establishes uh, you know, the basics of what the trucker is, is, is supposed to do in terms of delivering a load, somehow mm-hmm. um, subjects the driver to the control of the broker or the shipper. And the truth is, is that bill of lading for 150 years has not been a sufficient amount mm-hmm. of control mm-hmm. to um, subject them to their you know, the control of the broker or shipper such that their negligence would be um, imputed to the broker or shipper. And you, you've seen a few people argue that recently, and I've actually been quite surprised to see that it was successful. I think that that, um, to a certain degree, falls on the defense counsel who simply was unable to educate the judge and jury as to what a bill of lading actually is. And that all comes back to um, when you're faced with a situation, you've got to have a lawyer that understands trucking because if they don't, it's very difficult for them to understand the day-to-day concepts because the people on the jury in most cases and the judge for that matter are simply unfamiliar with you know, the simple concepts that uh, you know, are contained within a bill of lighting. And from that standpoint, I mean, in trying to convince a jury of some of the parameters that you just mentioned, uh, obviously you've got to take it down to language that, that the jury can understand because most probably have not worked in trucking or transportation. Is that is that accurate? I mean, you've got to really take the language down to the basic nitty-gritty, so to speak. Well, that's absolutely accurate. And I think at the end of the day, uh, when you're talking about control, and I as a broker or a shipper, um, whether I do or do not control a trucker, um, you know, you've seen some plaintiff's counsels, they sit there and say, well, hey, look, this bill of lading, it says you have to deliver it at a certain time, has to be kept in a certain uh, mm-hmm. you know temperature during transport, yada, yada, yada. But that has never in the history of this country been you know, a sufficient amount of control to make that broker or shipper liable for the negligence or alleged negligence of the, uh, of the driver. 
Um, but you're seeing a recent argument uh, from the plaintiff's bar that says that that is um, sufficient control, and it, it's, it's simply not the case. And I think that um, at the end of the day, a, a properly educated judge should never let that type of allegation through um, because a bill of lading is simply mm-hmm. a contract document. You know, This good will be delivered from point A to point B by the trucker. Do you think most truckers out there don't understand the language in a bill of lading? I think the truckers understand it perfectly well. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, they rely on it day to day. The people that do not understand it in many cases are their attorneys. Right. Uh, and if their attorneys don't get it, they can't explain it to the jury, and they certainly can't explain it to the judge. Yeah, and, and this, and in the case of what Mr. Boltman is asking for, he's uh, looking at three different components here. He says the carrier's got to be properly licensed. That seems obvious on the surface. Correct in that, uh, or there's some other hidden uh, ideas here that are not on the surface. Well, that appears to be obvious um, in, in terms of just the licensing requirements. Okay. Uh, if you ignore um, you know, the NAFTA issues, then uh, the licensing seems pretty straightforward. We'd have to read the actual proposed legislation itself, but it okay. sounds quite simple. And, and also, too, one of his proposals is that, the, uh, that there's an adequate amount of insurance uh, that is available to cover the losses with that. So, again, that seems very straightforward on the surface, correct? <laughs> Well, it seems straightforward. I'd want to see how he or who he is requiring to provide that insurance because okay. the term adequate insurance, you know, I would That's typically kind of say, you know, for a shipper broker, I mean, I would say adequate insurance is what you're required to pay in the event of a cargo loss, something along those lines. Um, but I would not typically, at, you know, suggest that a shipper or a broker carry, you know, say liability insurance for, you know, a major collision occurring in Chicago. Mm. Um so it would it would come down to how he was defining adequate insurance, and I would assume that he has proposed um, admirable language that uh, you know would work and mm-hmm. would address the actual concerns, um, you know, shipper or, or or broker on a historical perspective, as opposed to some of the newfound um, arguments that plaintiffs uh, bars are making. And, and also, too, one of the other components, one of the last components, he's contending that. There's got to be language in there that a carrier's got to have a better than unsatisfactory rating from the FMCSA. What does that mean exactly, and an, an better than an unsatisfactory rating? Have you heard those terms being kicked around before? I've heard those terms being kicked around. Uh, you know, on its face, it appears to be relatively simple. If you have a if you have a carrier that is, um, you know, has been deemed unsatisfactory for whatever reason, maybe it's you know hours of service violations, red tags, what have you. Um, you know, obviously they would, uh, under his proposed legislation, as I understand it, mm-hmm. uh, would not be entitled to some of the kind of the safe harbor provisions that other carriers would be entitled to um, to use. So, if a broker looks at a carrier that has an unsatisfactory rating, that mm-hmm. broker would not be entitled to um, not necessarily immunity, but they would not be entitled to um, protect themselves. Uh, under the statute as he's proposed. And and he's got the ears of lawmakers here. I know the legislation is set to be introduced by the end of the month by Representative John Duncan Jr., Republican out of Tennessee. And uh, in this language in the bill that is being proposed here, all of the components that we discussed would be in that, deeming a motor carrier to be safe to operate a properly licensed, has adequate insurance, has better than unsatisfactory rating from the FMCSA. Take this down a little bit further because how would all of this impact, say, the average driver out there? I mean, if there's any kind of blemishes on on their record, I mean, would this kind of take them out of the game if they don't meet the language criteria that is being proposed in this legislation by Representative John Duncan? Well, it would depend on what the actual final language is. Um, In most cases, as long as a driver, you know, as long as a carrier has a better than unsatisfactory rating, they have their, you know, the minimum amount of insurance, whether it's seven hundred fifty thousand or a million, depending on where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as, as long as they meet those provisions, uh, you're not going to have uh, any issues, as I understand it. And again, when I say they're not going to have any issues, it means that a broker or a shipper will be able to hire them mm-hmm. without fear that if something happens, it could be directed back to the broker or shipper. Um, With respect to individual owner operators or, you know, DOT numbers that are that are licensed and running around out there, if you have a concern that your safety record is unsatisfactory, Mm -hmm. 
this provision could – or this legislation could theoretically um, exclude you from a lot of um, loads in some mm-hmm. cases because a broker or shipper that is – um, say doing a whole lot of business in certain parts of the country would be very, very aware of the fact that um, you know you could have a court come in and say now that there's a safe harbor provision, mm-hmm. you didn't use it, you used somebody that was less than satisfactory, therefore you, the broker or shipper, should have known. It almost could create a secondary set of liability for, for carriers mm-hmm. um, that uh, don't meet that um, less than satisfactory burden. And is the TIA, in your estimation, right now at this point, trying to get all of this in place because do they ultimately want to uh, shape the language, in other words, embed the language that is going to be in the next version of the surface transportation reauthorization bill that's coming up before the Congress? That's got to be addressed as well. Are they trying to get that into the the, uh, surface transportation bill that's under debate right now? That is certainly my understanding. Okay. Um, it seems like a logical place for it. Otherwise, you'd have to have separate uh, standalone legislation. Okay. All right, drivers, we got a break here. It's 18 minutes after, and if you got a question, uh, give us a ring. It's 8888 Road Dog all across North America. And uh, we're talking about this uh, legislation that is uh, in the works. And basically, Bob Voltman versus the plaintiff's bar. Mr. Voltman runs the TIA the Transportation Intermediaries Association wants to get trial lawyers off the backs of shippers, property brokers, and motor carriers out there. And the best way to accomplish this, in his estimation, is to enact national standards for hiring truckers to contract uh, freight and also freight on the spot market. You know, there's a lot of legal issues that could come down the pike and eventually impact your operation out there on the road. Are you aware of this? Are you aware that some of these criteria may indeed be coming up soon. When we come back out of the break, I want to bring up with attorney Peyton Inge, you know, what is, how is the uh, current carrier selection process? Is it governed by state or local standards out there? Mr. Boltman was quoted as saying it's a patchwork quilt that forces brokers and shippers to play liability roulette with their business. Is he right about that? Coming back in a few minutes, drivers, don't go any place. You're tuned in to Sirius XM 128. The news and issues affecting drivers. Now, back to Sirius XM Road Dog Trucking News. Drivers, hey, welcome back. 23 minutes after, 223 East, 123 Central, 1123 in the West. Hopefully you know what time it is wherever you may be listening all across North America. Hope you're having a great day. My name is Mark Willis, and you'll find me on Facebook right now at Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking News. Attorney Peyton Inge is with me in the Dallas area talking about some uh, legislative moves that may be in the works, drivers, that may ultimately regulate uh, the the brokerage and the shipping industry and the trucking industry. All of it pretty much goes hand in hand. And uh, the complexities of the language can be uh, very difficult to decipher. And that's why Mr. Inge is on board to break the language down for us. And uh, drivers, again, if you got a call or a question for him, at 8888 Road Dog, you're more than welcome to jump in. We'd love to get your feedback, your observations, your thoughts. And uh, believe it or not, drivers, that uh, Mr. Inge also has been a trucker before. And you've got your own truck as well. Am I correct in that? I do, actually, yes. Okay, cool. Where can drivers find that? You take that all over the country. Yeah. You, uh, you travel? Yeah, I do. I drive up and down uh, the East Coast to some extent. And then um, I guess to some of the racetracks uh, over as far as Louisiana. Uh, and out to Alabama, New Jersey, all those places. Have an absolute ball. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, drivers, it's a really cool truck. And uh, send me those links, Peyton, and I'll put them, uh, put those pictures up on my Facebook page. And I appreciate you doing that. Tell drivers what you do during the week. Uh, you're out there uh, talking about the trucking industry, representing groups out there. Where can they find you on the web? Kind of set that up for us. Well, they can find me on the web at my law firm's website. It's just chambleyryan.com, C-H-A-M-B-L-E-E, Ryan, R-Y-A-N.com. We do or act as National Trial Council for trucking companies across the country. Um, What we do is if you have a case, whether it's New York or L.A., uh, we come in and we take a look at the case, and if we have to, we'll go try it. And uh, it's very rare to find a defense firm that actually understands the trucking industry. There's a lot of people out there that are good at what they do, but there aren't that many in the trucking industry. Okay. Um, so, so we are a, go ahead. I, I was going to say, and so this is why, you like you were mention, mentioning earlier, you need to find an attorney or a firm 
that understands trucking. I mean, that's the bottom line. Because, right, you don't want to have a council go in and represent you and they don't know uh, squat when it comes to trucking rules and regulations. Right. And what we find is that it's very difficult for uh, most truckers to make or help their attorney understand um, their side of the story. Because unless you've been up behind that wheel, shifting gears, and had a little Ford Pinto cut you off on a downhill (laughs) slope while you're trying to brake, it's hard to fully grasp just how easy it is to get into collision uh, and just how common it is for a little four-wheeler to cause the actual collision. And unless you've seen those little scenarios play out, it's very, very difficult to – go in and mount an effective defense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when you said Port Pinto, I just started to cringe. I just remember those things were exploding, you know, exploding <laughs> time bombs. Man, you hit those things and they were up. Holy cow. Well, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you talking to the drivers out there uh, about this uh, whole idea of uh, coming up with specific language on uh, what may be needed when it comes to uh, brokerage and uh, freight contracts out there and how it trickles down to the drivers out there. Uh, We mentioned uh, these proposals being kicked around by Mr. Uh, Voltman with the Transportation Intermediaries Association, and uh, a lot of folks are indeed starting to sit up and take notice. You talked about this during the last break, uh, about the need for the carrier to be properly licensed, about the need to have the adequate insurance out there. What exactly does an unsatisfactory rating from the FMCSA actually mean and and take it a step further here and when it comes to shippers and brokers would they have a certain number of days to determine a carrier's fitness prior to selection and why was that time frame selected if i recall correctly they picked uh 35 days as the period um and then obviously the uh brokers i should say the carrier's information is updated on a 30-day rolling basis by the csa um, so the intent there is to provide is to give the brokers and shippers um, a window uh, within which they they have to determine um, the carrier's fitness based on the federal guidelines. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously the the intent there is to make it easier for a shipper or broker to determine if they fit in that kind of safe harbor provision uh, when they're hiring somebody, regardless of whether you're located in uh, you know in Illinois or Texas mm-hmm. or California. And those venues can be very different uh, to some extent. So it would allow um, kind of a universal federal standard as mm-hmm. opposed to a local state law standard, which is kind of what we're seeing now. Okay, and that's basically the way it sets up. That's the current carrier selection process by state or local standards when it comes to applying business. Essentially, because at the end of the day, it's um, you know if a plaintiff files a lawsuit, um, you know he's going to argue based on his local court rulings that X, Y, or Z is the law. And so, a broker or shipper located you know in one part of the country. Um, has no real idea where an accident could occur, mm-hmm. uh, and he's kind of up against at the moment uh, local judges or or, or, or local uh, local juries that uh, you know it's, it's hard to prepare for. Okay, and so, uh, Mr. Boltman described this as liability roulettes, uh, and those are some of the phrases that are that are coming out uh, in connection with this. Now, the FMCSA bases its carrier safety ratings on the very highly controversial program known as CSA, the Compliance, Safety, and Accountability Review. Lots and lots of critics out there to CSA, correct? Same as uh, what you're hearing, I would imagine. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of critics of that. I mean, anytime you have a uh, you know a broad government program, it's going to have faults, and it will misidentify um, certain carriers. Uh, it's not the intent of the program, but it, it, it it's a a reality mm-hmm. is that certain carriers are you know improperly identified as being unsafe or or things of that nature uh, when in fact it's simply you know they they were smaller and they had uh, you know maybe one or two um, bad apples or maybe uh, an unfortunate incident, but that doesn't necessarily make them unsafe, but it does take them a while to recover from that un- unsatisfactory rating. yeah, yeah, and Boltman, I was reading contends the CSA is a tool. Oh, uh, only for FMCSA to gauge a carrier safety fitness, and that shippers and brokers are not in the business of determining which carriers are safe to operate and which are not. Correct in that? Uh, completely correct. Uh, and and I think that is the goal of this legislation is to take the onus off of you know the broker and the shipper mm. to determine 
whether or not a, a trucking company is safe. They don't have time to do that. Their job is to move a load from point A to point B, and they're going to take whoever they think is, is best capable of doing that. Yeah. But they don't have the time uh, or resources, really, to go in and call the carrier and do their own little safety background check. Yeah, isn't the FMCSA expected to publish a notice of uh, rulemaking coming up in late May, early June? I, I think they're expected to modify CSA. They, they want to try to expand the data sets used to produce an overall safety rating for carriers. Uh, I think that currently the agency uses the on-site compliance reviews to develop an overall safety rating. Problems with that in your estimation? Well, you know, the problem is it, it, it comes back to reporting and okay. – um, and to some degree, you know, the carrier and I guess the statistics that they use to come up with those reports. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing their new uh, their new proposed rules uh, in, in May and June. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's uh, a lot of debate about how exactly all of that is going to change. I think uh, what a lot of the uh, uh, state inspectors would like to see they'd like to be able to upload some of the information from roadside. Uh, when uh, when some of the data is collected at that point, and then have that data input uh, then collected into the CSA uh, scoring system. Drivers, again, it's 8888 Road Dog Paint. I got a break here for some news. If you've got a question or a comment for him, you're more than welcome to join us. And uh, drivers, we're talking about a very important conversation that could ultimately trickle down to what you are doing out there on the road. And uh, basically, there is uh, some moves afoot. Uh, by Mr. Boltman of the Transportation Intermediaries Association who wants to get trial lawyers off the backs of shippers, property brokers, and motor carriers. And he says the best way and perhaps the only way to accomplish this is to convince the Congress to enact some national standards for hiring truckers to move some of the contract and uh, fre- and uh, market on the, uh, on the spot market, some of the freight on the spot market, I should say. And Attorney Peyton Inge, is with me right now, and we're talking about the complexities of this. It's a complicated subject. And drivers, you know, when you are out there dealing with a broker or a shipper, do you know all of the language that goes into the contract that you are signing? Do you take the time to read these things? Do you understand the language of the contracts that you are signing? If you're an independent owner-operator out there, when you do business, do you read these contracts from top to bottom? Give us a call, or do you just kind of skim through these contracts and say to yourself, well, I know this, I know the language, and I'll be able to sign this without any problems. Does that ever come back and bite you, so to speak, by you not understanding some of the language in those contracts? 8888 Road Dog. Back in a few minutes right here on Sirius XM 128. This is Road Dog Trucking News. Join the show by calling 8888-ROAD-DOG. Drivers, welcome back. It is 37 minutes after. I'm Mark Willis, and again, it is, like the guy with the big voice said, 8888-ROAD-DOG. I'm up on Facebook at right now at SiriusXM's Road Dog Trucking News. Great conversation going on with Peyton Inch. We're talking about language drivers, language and contracts and laws. you got to understand the language of what you're dealing with out there on the road. We're going to get back. To the conversation in just a minute. First, though, the top stories brought to you this time by Schneider National. Volkswagen AG faces increasing opposition to its $9.2 billion bid to buy the rest of heavy-duty truck maker Scania AB after the third biggest Swedish shareholders group rejected that offer. Al-Qaeda, which led 2.4% of Sweden-based Scania stock at the end of March, said today that it would not support Volkswagen's bid to buy at $30 a share because the price is too low. Now, Volkswagen, which owned about 60% of Scania, controls about 90% of its voting rights, declined to comment on the status of the offer. Canada's two major freight railroads reported higher first quarter earnings from a year ago despite very tough winter weather conditions. Canadian National reported a net income of $623 million Canadian dollars, or $0.75 cents a share, as compared with a net income of $555 million Canadian, or $0.65 cents a share. Higher shipments of petroleum and chemicals offset higher weather-related costs, such as fuel, according to the Montreal-based company. And also a new report out by the Department of Transportation indicates states and municipalities seeking federal aid this year to revamp critical infrastructure projects have until April the 28th to apply for a popular grant program managed by the USDOT. Drivers, again, that's the news. And again, it's 8888 Road Dog. Great pleasure to have Attorney 
Peyton Inge back on the radio with me, and we're talking about the complexities of the language out there. And in case you are just now joining us here on the program, uh, what we started talking about is a story involving Bob Boltman versus the plaintiff's bar. Boltman runs the Transportation Intermediaries Association. He wants to get trial lawyers off the backs of shippers, property brokers, and motor carriers. In his group's view, the best and perhaps only way to accomplish this is to convince the Congress to enact national standards for hiring truckers to move contract and uh, and uh, spot market freight. And uh, Mr. End is breaking all of it down for us, talking about what it means, how it ultimately may indeed have an impact on how you are indeed doing business out there. And Peyton, again, thank you, sir. Uh, it does get down to the language, right? I mean, understanding the complexities of the language, understanding what goes in to what makes up these laws, all of it boils down to wordplay, correct in that? No, absolutely. Yeah, and, and this is where I think uh, that if people don't understand the language, if they don't understand the the nuances, this is where they could get tripped up from time to time. Important to understand the language in in what whatever whatever contract forms they're dealing with. Absolutely, and um, in, in looking at contract terms, they're written so complex and so dense that it's very very difficult for most people, you know, anybody out there, whether I don't care whether you're a doctor, lawyer, trucker. Yeah. Half the people that read it can't understand it, and it's very very important to read it, think about it, and maybe ask some questions about it. Make sure everybody's on the same page before you sign anything and before you agree to do anything. Yeah, and you find that's what trips a lot of people up. They just simply just don't read those things when 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 they uh, when they put their signature on the bottom line. Yeah, and that's what we find a lot of the time is that um, it's kind of a natural human instinct when you when you get handed a four or five page document of real tiny handwriting, you just assume that it says what you think it does. You read the first couple of paragraphs, and then you sign that last page. <laughs> yeah. you got to be careful, because you might yep. be signing your life away. Yeah, yeah. And, and when in the case of what uh, Mr. Boltman's trying to do, getting some of the language changed, it all gets down to, you know, understanding how it impacts folks and, uh, you know, what their uh, employment role may eventually be. And uh, speaking of that, concerning another story out there, I wanted to get your feedback about uh, the move in some states to try to change the language in some of the contracts about how people are are being paid, uh, either employee or independent contractor, all of it designed to generate tax revenue. Back to a lot of states out there, there's some charges that big labor may be involved trying to get employment classifications changed. Uh, what are you hearing? What are you hearing from groups out there about trying to change the the uh, employment designation uh, for independent contractors to make them employees. What's going on with that? Well, there's a huge push by certain government organizations and to some extent a few states that uh, are trying to reclassify um, certain individuals that have been designated as independent contractors for years mm -hmm. as employees. Uh, and they're doing that for a few different reasons. Um, you mentioned organized labor, you mentioned tax revenue, and I think both of those are directly on point. Um, but the end goal there is to shift uh, independent contractors uh, into the employee ranks of some of these larger businesses uh, and thereby increase uh, you know, the tax revenue that some of these uh, either state or federal agencies are collecting. Okay, so uh, it is, it's is—it's dollar-driven. I've heard ch charges, allegations that a lot of the big labor groups like the Teamsters want to make moves like this because it would protect some of the union jobs out there. Uh, any truth to that? I'm sure you probably have heard some feedback concerning that. I have definitely heard that, and to be honest with you, it makes a lot of sense because okay. um, if, if I'm a union member, I don't really necessarily want – uh, independent contractor out there because he may be able to undercut me to some degree, or maybe he's making more money. I don't know, but at the same time, I don't have any control over him, and that's uh, you know one less job that's available to me. Yeah. Uh, and so I would be highly, um, I, I would definitely believe that there's a, a heavy union push in some of these categories. And, and take that a step further too. And suppose somebody doesn't want to be changed. In other words, that uh, say they're. Uh, an independent contractor, all of a sudden, now they're an employee uh, through whatever workings or mechanisms there is. Is that something they can argue in court, uh, that that their employment classification has changed? Do they have any legal rights to maybe fight that? Well, you know, it, it would depend on in what uh, capacity your 
uh, employee versus independent contractor has been challenged. If, for okay. instance, you were working in New York, um, you might have some issues because if you were determined to be an employee as opposed to independent contractor, you can face pretty significant fines, including some uh, criminal penalties as well. Mm-hmm. So you have a pretty serious a decision to make when you decide to challenge that. Uh, if you're challenged, uh, you know, by the IRS, something like that, you can, you know, go through the tax um, process where you're contesting their. Uh, if you're an employer, you you can contest their conclusion that you have employees versus independent contract, contractors, things of that nature. And then there's always federal review of the IRS's determination. Um, but that gets a little bit expensive, but you don't have some of the criminal penalties um, that, uh, like, for instance, New York has enacted. Mm-hmm. And I think they did that with the clear intention that people not argue with their conclusion <laughs> that, you know, you're an employee – not an independent contractor, and if, oh, by the way, you decide to contest that, this is what could happen to you. Oh, goodness. It's kind of a strong-arm tactic. Yeah. (laughs) Man, that's like uh, hanging a sword of uh, Damocles over your head, for goodness sakes. My goodness. Well, but but that's the thing about it, though. It's up to the... It's up to that individual person to decide, okay, I want to I want to challenge this. And, and again, it gets back to knowing or having an attorney in the back pocket, <clears throat> pardon me, that uh, does know the complexities of the trucking laws and the languages out there. I would imagine that uh, as far as your job is concerned, this is always an ever-changing dynamic when it comes to trucking laws and regulations. Uh, always a moving target, so to speak. Uh, you see probably regulations that come down the pike all the time. That may have an impact on the industry, may be under discussion, may actually be happening, may be being kicked into uh, into gear, so to speak, where it's going to apply to so many folks out there. Is it an ever-moving target when it comes to trucking laws? It is to some degree. Um, it, it absolutely is. I mean, the, the trucking industry is just so important in this country, and I think that a lot of the lawmakers don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the public doesn't understand it, and um, you do see – a bit of a moving target in terms of laws that uh, impact truckers, um, whether it's uh, wage and hour laws or whether it is um, some of the liability aspects that are applicable to shippers and brokers who provide the truckers with their different loads. Uh, so it absolutely is a moving target. It's uh, important to stay on top of. How do you defend stuff like that? I mean, I would imagine that's got to take a lot of research, whatever the topic may be, obviously. But, I mean, I would imagine it's got to take a lot of research. you got to make sure that your court briefs are all... Uh, prepared because I would imagine you don't want to go into the courtroom and stand before a judge and not be ready. <laughs> well, I can imagine that's going to be the last case scenario you want to present. Yeah, it, it, you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, it's all about uh, doing the groundwork. And, you know, what the rule may be in one court in one state, it might be different uh, 50 miles away. Uh, and that's the nature of our court system, uh, whether it's state to state or state to federal. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you're presented with a question, you always go in and you always research it at the local level. Yeah. And when you do go in and you're talking to the judge, you make sure you're the most educated person on that topic in the area. And be friendly and polite in the process and have fun doing it. So, yeah. Okay. That's one of the key points I would imagine, right? I mean, if you can kind of put the judge at ease when you're presenting the topic, whatever's under discussion out there, does that kind of make uh, make the groundwork a little bit easier to try to convince a judge about the importance of why your side should win? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and a lot of it is just being able to present your point of view in a friendly and reasonable position, and people tend to follow that, and they understand it, and uh, what we do find is occasionally we're we're talking about close points of law where, you know, some laws and some courts say one thing, and other courts might say something different, and it's not, you know, directly on points. The judge doesn't know which side to go with, Uh, and it's your job as, uh, you know, as as an attorney to kind of educate the judge, and uh, and help them reach uh, the conclusion that favors your client. What What do you say to folks who want to go in and represent themselves? Uh, you know, I know it's probably their constitutional right to do that, but when you hear folks doing that, I've read stories about this in the press uh, for the longest time. People get up and try to try to prevent, uh, try to present rather their case in front of a judge. I would imagine that's got to get shot right out of court real quick, right? I mean, is that uh, pretty much throwing it right over to the other side and saying you win? Well, it is in, in a lot of cases. Um, Have you seen some that of much? yours? Go ahead. Have you seen that that much? 
a surprising amount of time. Um, really? You know, particularly in cases where you know it's unpaid freight bills, or um, you know, the cargo damage claims. Okay. I'll see people go in and represent themselves, and if you're talking about five to five to ten thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. Okay. But you know, you can eat that up pretty quick if you have to go pay an attorney to represent you. Uh, but if you're talking about a, a larger claim, yeah. you know, something above that $10,000 mark, you, it would uh, be very, very smart to at least talk to an attorney. And then if uh, you have any uh, ability to do so, to re- you know, to hire an attorney, whether it's you know maybe through insurance or yeah. you know, maybe some sort of payment plan, anything it takes to get you an attorney. Okay, absolutely. So this is why you got to maybe find somebody, talk to them, and make sure you understand the complexities of it. i got a break here one more time. Drivers, again, it's 88 88- 88 Road Dog taking an in-depth look at the legal process, drivers, uh, with attorney Peyton Inge. Uh, we started out talking about the story involving the uh, Transportation Intermediaries Association, and then uh, we started talking about the complexities of the language, how important it is for you to understand all of the documentation that you're reading, you're signing out there, because ultimately it does impact what you are indeed doing. Uh, interesting that a lot of people still will, will want to represent themselves, when it comes to court cases out there, I would imagine nine chances out of ten that if there's an attorney present on the other side, uh, you're not going to win if you're presenting that argument uh, on your own. So uh, if you got a quick question for Peyton, again, it's 8888 Road Dog. A couple of more things with him, and I'm going to let him go on to the rest of his day. We'll be back in a minute right here, Sirius XM 128. <laughs> The news and issues affecting drivers. Now, back to Sirius XM Road Dog Trucking News. Drivers, same name on Facebook, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking News. That's where you'll find me pretty much all the time, except overnight i got to get some sleep. <laughs> but I do update that site quite a bit, drivers, with news, information, traffic, weather, and uh, latest weather information coming in for Dallas, Fort Worth, and upper low uh, is going to scoot in from the west. That's going to move a dry line in behind it. In West Texas, and storms are going to fire up this afternoon in West Texas, and they're going to proceed to track to the east. That means that the setup so far is uh, far west of North Texas. But if you're traveling around the Abilene area, say around I-20, you could run into some pretty stout thunderstorm activity as we go through the course of the afternoon. I'm going to follow it for you on Facebook at SiriusXM's Road Dog Trucking News. Also want to send a thank you out to attorney Peyton Inge for talking about the uh, complexities of the law drivers. We've covered a lot of very complicated topics, this one involving the Transportation Intermediaries Association and uh, what they are trying to do. And Peyton, as we get ready to wrap it up, break this down for the drivers out there. Do they need to be overly concerned about what the uh, Transportation Intermediaries Association is trying to do? Will the language trickle down? to what the drivers are doing out there. Could this impact their business operation, in other words? It absolutely absolutely could impact their business operations. I think it'll come down to um, what the actual final language of the statute is. Um, But I certainly think that the goal of the statute is admirable and that it's designed to help the trucking industry and kind of protect it from some of these recent moves that we've seen by uh, the plaintiffs bar, you know, the plaintiffs around the country to kind of pick on trucks as a target of opportunity mm. and try and make uh, make a quick buck off of uh, some hardworking drivers. Okay, so should the drivers call their legislative representatives on the state level, federal level, to maybe express their viewpoints about the TIA's actions here? Absolutely. Um, you know, the drivers want to be as informed as possible, uh, and they also want to let uh, their elected representatives know uh, what they think about the proposed legislation and just how important uh, federal oversight is, uh, to some degree, of these different um, state and, uh, and, and plaintiffs' uh, issues that we've seen. Okay. Outstanding, sir. Thank you. And again, I really appreciate you explaining the, the legal hurdles, the obstacles, the language out there. You know, most of us are not attorneys, and that's why it's great to have you on to talk about, you know, what uh, is important when it comes to understanding the legal languages of these various measures that are indeed coming up. Let's get to 